Welcome to the Bayless School District in St. Louis County, just south of St. Louis City itself, for our HECTV Live program today, The Science Behind Investigating a Crime. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Gore, your host for HECTV Live, and I'm very happy to welcome you to a computer classroom here at the Bayless Elementary School. We're at Bayless today because we've collaborated with both the video journalism students from Bayless High School, as well as the St. Louis County Police Department, to create what's going to be, I think, a very interesting program on what goes on in crime scene investigation, the science behind investigating a crime. As always, we'll have interactive schools joining us via video conference. We've got a live group of kids right here from Bayless joining us as well, and we welcome your questions if you're joining us via the web or St. Louis area television. You can email us your questions to live at hectv.org. That's live at hectv.org. I look forward to getting them texted to my phone so we can incorporate them into the program. As I said, we're here in the Bayless School District today for, today, for the program, and our guests I want to take a moment to introduce now. We'll begin with Officer Eric Middendorf. Eric, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, man. And Detective Brian Schmidt. Brian, thanks for being here. Before we start to talk about the crime and get into all the cool stuff, give the students a little bit of idea about what is it you do, Eric, and what got you interested in police work? Well, uh, I've been a police officer for almost three years now, and uh, actually, I just, I'm an SRO right now at the Bayless School District, so I'm at the school every day. Um, between 7.30 and 3.30 dealing with uh, issues at the school and uh, interacting with kids and whatnot. And uh, I have a teaching degree, so it, that kind of oh. put me in a good spot to, to be with the kids and whatnot. But uh, I've always been interested in police work, and uh, it's just something I really enjoy doing. Very cool. And for those of you who aren't in the know educationally, SRO is School Resource Officer. And, and Brian, talk a little bit about your history. Okay. Uh, I've been a police officer for 15 years. I spent five years with Missouri State Highway Patrol uh, before I came to St. Louis County. I spent five years on patrol. And then I've been a detective for five years. Um, I have a uh, master's degree in criminology. And uh, I've just been doing this for five years. Now, talk a little bit about the difference between officer and detective. How does one become a detective, and how does okay. that process work? Um, in our department, a detective is just a job descriptor. When you, uh, you go into the detective bureau, you become a detective. I'm still, my rank's still police officer. I haven't been promoted. And some departments, a detective spot is a promotion, and ours is just a job descriptor of what you do. And so the difference, as we'll see when we go into this crime scene, is that Eric, in essence, you become the officer who responds to the person who's saying, something happened to me. Correct. And you're coming in, Brian, to actually then process the scene. Yeah, he, uh, Eric would be the reporting officer and I would be the investigating officer. So that's an important distinction to understand as we begin to talk about how they're going to be involved in the situation that we're going to see. I guess it makes sense that we just start with giving everybody a chance to see the video of the crime. Our interactive schools have actually had a chance to see this video in advance, and I'm going to come to you guys in a little bit for some responses to that video. But for the rest of the world, you're going to get the chance to see a crime actually happen as it happens, and I bet Officers, this would be really nice if normally all crimes would be videotaped in this way and you guys could solve them much simpler. It sure would. But uh, sadly, the world is not necessarily like things are here at Bayless High School. So let's find out what the crime was.
The crime has happened. And again, the police officer would be thrilled if that kind of videotape was available. That video and the other ones you're going to see, don't forget, has been created by members of the Bayless Television Program under the leadership of Mike Hawkins. Superb students. So right now, guys, let's give them a, some applause. Um, really superb work that they've done that you're going to see throughout the show. Now, obviously, our interactive groups had a chance to look at this video in advance, and one of the things we were interested in having them do was pretend to be an eyewitness to the crime. And based upon it being an eyewitness, what is it they noticed about those guys who passed that woman at the beginning of the video? So guys, we're going to go to some schools and let them give us, give us a sense of that, and then we'll talk a little bit about eyewitness testimony and how it relates to an investigation. So Jesse, I'm going to go to you at St. Elizabeth Middle School in Missouri. What did you notice about the, the folks who were passing by the woman as she walked into the building? Three people walked past her. Two were wearing jeans, and one was wearing an air, one 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 was wearing aeros aeropostal sweatpants. They were all wearing dark colored hoodies, and we think they all had tennis shoes, and they all had their hoods up. Well done, Jesse. Some very good specific information there, and I hope people have noticed one particular part of that description. Because interestingly enough, it's going to vary just a little bit with what we learned from our next group. Let's go to New Jersey. Sam Sell, Upper Elementary School, what did you notice about those three guys? Three males in dark clothing and hoodies, two in jeans and one in sweatpants with the Hollister logo. Thank you very much. Very nicely done. And you'll notice that in one instance we have Aeropostal sweatpants. And in one instance, we have Hollister logo. And I'll admit, the first time, the third time, the 15th time I've watched that video, I haven't even noticed what the logo was at all. It wasn't anything I was looking for. But as we begin to talk a little bit about just people noticing crimes or being witnesses, is that unusual, Brian, for people to have those kinds of differences? I mean, how do you deal with witness, eyewitness testimony? You try to get a consensus. Um, a lot of times, dark blue and black sweatshirts are described as the same or vice versa. Um, you know, uh, what somebody might consider a, a hoodie to a sweatshirt is different, and it's, you just go with what you try to get an overall idea of what they're talking about. And Eric, as an officer who responds to the scene as it happens, your job is just to take what they say. Is there any kind of way that you could say, are you sure it was Hollister logo, or is that a bad thing to do? Um, no, generally we get a brief description so we can put that out over the air if it just happened, so we can get more uh, police officers in the area to search for the su suspect. But uh, generally, we try to ask if there's any type of logo that you can notice. Uh, a lot of people like Aeropostel, Hollister, they kind of have same, similar logo, logos, so just more they can describe it, the better. But like you said, uh, different people see different things, so sometimes it gets kind of challenging when there's different eyewitness testimony. I would think. We also ask the students to look at the crime scene and think, what pieces of evidence do they see there that might be important, that, that police might actually be interested in? And one of the interesting things to be aware of is when we sent it to the students in advance, they didn't have that little summary at the end. They didn't see, like, the, the piece of fiber on the floor or anything like that at the end. It ended just as the guy was running out the door. So they were basing it on that real-time um, response there. So we've got a variety of evidence ready to go. We've got some witnesses ready to go. And now, of course, the crime has to be discovered. Someone's got to go and see what happened, and we're going to find out about what the process is now when these officers get involved. So let's find out about the discovery of the crime. What's your emergency? So the witness has now discovered a crime. And so she's going to call in. But you guys are going to notice something, hopefully, in those two videos. There's been a weather change between what happened the night before and now that next morning when uh, she arrives and sees the scene. And we were wondering if that potentially could make any kind of difference. So we asked for some student input about what they noticed about that. And Jade, I know Abbotsford Middle School is in the bridge up there in Wisconsin. Jade, if you're able to come in right now, why don't you give us a little bit of information about what you noticed about the weather the night before versus that morning? The weather the night before was some type of precipitation. Rain, I'm guessing, because if it was snow, the person would be wearing more than a hoodie. I think the weather does affect some of the crime scene if water does wash away fingerprints. The guy who stole the laptop left the window open so the rain could have come in the room and washed some of the fingerprints away. 
Also, the prints he left on the other two windows were washed away. But in the end, they would probably still catch him because his fingerprints were on the door on the way out, and they would stay intact regardless of the weather. Very good specific information. Thank you, Jade. Talk a little bit about the weather and how it potentially affects an investigation, Brian. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, rain is on the out exterior things or it works against me. It does wash things away. Um, there are different ways I could still get evidence from it, but uh, the easiest way to get fingerprints, they do wash away, unfortunately. But uh, um, another thing, snow also can uh, leave more shoe print evidence for me, uh, where in the summer I wouldn't get it, mm -hmm. in the winter I could. So it, different things give you different things to work with. And if we were actually outside and there was some sort of blood that was on the ground and then the rain came along, would you still, I mean, I, I see all my little CSI shows or whatever, and there's something that's going to light up for me on the, on the asphalt, would you still be able to say that there were trace amounts of blood even if there had been a rainstorm? Or? Yes, there could. There, it still remains. I mean, I've had people try to wash away with bleach, wash away with everything like that, and we still find trace amounts. So it, uh, they may think it's gone, but it's still there. Okay. So at this point now, the, cr the crime has been discovered, and the call has been made, and now the police come in, and Officer Middendorf and his partner, Officer Aiton, if I'm remembering correctly, Correct. are going to be talking to our witness. So let's run that video now. So were you the last person here last night? Yes, I was. I was coming back from a meeting around like 5.30. Okay. Did you see anything suspicious? Or? I mean, I saw about three boys walk down and I said hi, but that was all. They were bundled up in dark clothing. How old did they look? I didn't get it. Black, black, white? Um, they were white, I believe. Yes. You sure they were males? Yes. Do you have, how tall were they? Um, not, sure. not sure. I didn't really pay attention. Okay, and then you uh, locked up the store here? Yes, I locked up all of it. Uh, my office is over there, and I was leaving. I locked that up. I turned off what the lights. What time was that that you left? Around 6.30 at night. So talk a little bit about just the process. We've asked some students some questions about this video, which we'll get to in a minute for their responses. But generally speaking, when you're dealing with a witness and that kind of thing, who might be very upset, potentially, what kinds of things are you trying to do just to get them calm and ready to give you information to start with? Well, it's just, uh, it's important to uh, calmly talk to them and let them know that there's not a threat any longer uh, in the building. That's why when we first get there, we clear the building to make sure there's nobody else in there that's not supposed to be, um, and just kind of talk it through with her uh, and go, go back through what, what she remembers. And are there some certain standard questions that you've always got ready to go, like in terms of like time, location, or how you saw something or whatever that usually just comes up automatically? Um, generally we ask for you know the different pedigree of the victim, um, her information, uh, what what she does at the business or if it's her residence um, and then we run through the questions of you know when was the last time you saw this place locked up or what was here when you left we go through kind of those questions and uh, what's out of place now. And Brian, do you notice, is it rare or does it happen more frequently than one might think that a witness in the course of that original interview says one thing and then realizes maybe in the calmness of two days later or something, oh, I forgot something else. Do you get a lot of additional information? Oh, yes. Um, you know, a lot of times when they, they have the initial shock, especially when they're times of the reporting officer, by the time I get there, there's a time lapse and they're almost more relaxed when they see me uh, versus uh, the reporting officer. And uh, I kind of go through almost the same questions. A lot of times I'll get, you know, I get something missing, they make it the reporting officer, you know, this is missing, and then by the time I get there, it's this, 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 and this is, are missing. So mm -hmm. that's why a lot of times I have to get back to the reporting officer and go, actually, you know, six things were stolen, not one, because, it, you know, the first time they just focus on the first thing they see, and then by the time they get to me, they're like, oh, yeah, this this piece of jewelry is also missing and this and that. So. Well, I think that's an important thing to realize because interactive groups had the chance to watch the video of the witness interview and they also had a chance to read the 
police report that you guys created. And there are indeed additional pieces of information in the police report that were in the witness interview. And that's not an unusual situation necessarily. Oh, not at all. Okay, let's go to some reactions from students about what they noticed about that witness testimony. We asked them about strengths and weaknesses of what that uh, witness was able to provide that might help your investigation. So Jesse, let's go back to you at St. Elizabeth again. She had a weak statement about the windows and she had a fairly good description of the suspects but we felt it was a fairly weak testimony all around. All right, so there's our thoughts from Jesse. Thanks very much. Let's go up to New Jersey again. Sam still up our elementary school. What do you think about the witness testimony? She had a strength on being able to describe at least two of the three males she saw that evening. She had a weakness of not sure she was clear about the time she left the building. Very good, very good specifics. And one of the things you always have to remember is, especially when you guys are looking at this video versus when she was experiencing it, is that you're watching the video with the idea that I'm looking for stuff that might help the police. When I'm walking down the street, I'm not thinking, oh, that person who's passing me might actually be going to commit a crime in another two hours or whatever. So it makes sense that she would be missing certain details. Let's go up to Bailey in Durand High School, Wisconsin. Bailey, if you're there, what strengths and weaknesses did you all notice? Um, strengths, she knew what or when she left the office and how she left it, but she was very weak on her description of the boys. Thank you very much. And is that unusual for people like, I would know, it makes sense to me that I would know my location better because I'm in that office all the time than I would know someone who just passed me like in the hallway. Is that unusual? Oh, not at all. Um, you know, a lot of things, uh, people are actually poor judges of height. You'll tell some, ask somebody how tall someone is and you get, you know, 5'10 a lot of times, and they're actually like 6'2 or 5'6. <laughs> you know, it's just uh, a lot of people are poor judges of height when someone passes them. You can, I usually go with myself an example where they taller than me or shorter than me. And uh, also the worst example is uh, if you try to get someone's weight, people are terrible judges of weight. <laughs> so, <laughs> Yes, I, that's a good thing maybe. I don't know. Um, we also had a question that came in about police reports. So I want to go back to Samsel again in New Jersey. What's your question, New Jersey? If a witness does not give you a lot of information, how do you determine what to include in your report? So, Eric? I couldn't quite If a witness doesn't give you a lot of information, how do you determine what to include in your report? <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we don't specifically have a checklist of things, um, but um, like, like I said earlier, she may not have noticed the three people walking in the alley, but if they uh, aren't typically in the alley and if it's a busy place, it's kind of hard to, hard to describe. But um, it depends on the timing and uh, the different aspects um, of what she can completely remember uh, when she left, uh, if that's normal or if, if that's not normal. So at this point, we've got a crime, a witness has reported the crime, and we've begun to get somewhat witness testimony. We're going to return to witness testimony near the end of the program as we develop a list of suspects for this crime. But let's begin to process the crime scene now, what Brian gets to do on a rather regular basis. And before we begin to look at the evidence, talk a little bit about the crime scene unit, what you do, how you got involved with that. Okay. Um, in St. Louis County, uh, we have uh, 16 crime scene detectives and three supervisors. Uh, we're on 24 hours a day because crime doesn't wait until the morning. Uh, we, we're always around. Uh, we respond to uh, all crimes in St. Louis County, uh, from larcenies uh, all the way up to all the major homicides. Um, our unit uh, are specially trained police officers. We are police officers. Uh, we're not civilians. Uh, some departments have begun to go to civilian uh, crime scenes, but not us. Um, I think it benefits because I've been the reporting officer, and I know what, uh, what they're going to give me, and I can move, move on with that. Um, we always begin with an overall, work for, I work from the outside in, uh, looking for evidence, and uh, I'm specially trained in identifying and collecting evidence. Very good, and the first piece of evidence we're gonna look at is fiber evidence that was found on scene. We've got a box here, and is this the basic nature of an evidence box that you guys always use? Yes. And inside of that, I found an envelope which says number four, fibers from NE, which I'm going to assume means northeast, yes. um, corner of the desk. And right inside here, of course, is the fiber evidence. And we're going to begin to show you a video now, which, which gives you the process that Brian used to collect this fiber evidence. Then we're going to go to some student questions. So you're coming in, and you're making some sort of distinction, I guess. Four is the number four because it's the fourth thing you noticed in the room that you decided to process. Is that how the number's determined? Uh, I just. Uh 
is actually the fourth piece in. Okay. I started uh, with the, my fingerprint evidence, I always letter, uh, and then my physical evidence, I number. And I started with, uh, number one was the first as I came in, and number four was the furthest, fourth furthest in. Uh, just we always keep it numbered uh, to distinguish between one piece of evidence and another. That's for court and also for our lab people to be able to distinguish their findings. If everything was just labeled evidence from this crime scene, um, our DNA person, our fiber person, our fingerprint experts would all have just, all their evidence would be lump lumped together when it should be separated. So the so numbers help separate pieces of evidence. And you work from the outside in, so to speak. Yes. Okay. And here is the amount of fiber that we got, which I'm going to put down there, and our extraordinary cameraman, Peter Foggy, will be able to zoom in on that for you so you can see in real space the amount of fiber we've got. And we've gotten some student questions about the fiber as well that we're, that we're going to respond to and, and, and look at. And so I want to go to Rachel up in Durand, Wisconsin. Rachel, what's your question about the process of using this fiber evidence? Um, what will they analyze about the fabric? Great question. So what happens now? Oh, we have a, a person in our lab that's into trace evidence. Uh, they can break down the chemical makeup of the, the fiber itself into what dyes were used, what material it's made out of, your, uh, your percentage of blend, uh, you know, cotton versus uh, uh, synthetic fibers. And that can include uh, certain um, makes of uh, sweatshirts and exclude others. So that helps narrow it down to what the person's wearing. And that's a great segue to the next question that we got from Samsel Upper Elementary School. Take it away, New Jersey. How does a little piece of fabric further your investigation? <laughs> this little piece can help uh, narrow down what, what a sweatshirt is. I mean, just uh, like I said, you get the color dye, so you get exactly what, what color it is. Um, many companies, you may think, are getting the same black sweatshirt every year, but they're changing the color dye combination. So they can actually tell you that this sweatshirt was made one year ago, two years ago, uh, what lot it came out of, actually, which uh, manufacturing, if they have more than one uh, manufacturing area. And then uh, when it's, uh, get down to what it's made of, uh, the blend, because um, each company kind of has their own uh, specific uh, blends they use. So you can get it down to what company made the sweatshirt, and that will help a lot. And can you get it down to, like, when it was created and, like, where it might have been shipped to for potential purchases? Uh, yeah, it could if they're really into, like each uh, manufacturing place has their own uh, blend that they use, you can really get down to where it was actually manufactured. Wow. Let's go to Seth at St. Elizabeth Middle School. Seth, what's the question that you all have? How would you know that it was fiber from the suspect? Yeah, great question, because obviously all the fiber in the world doesn't necessarily make a difference. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't. Um, Sometimes, I mean, if it's obvious, you can ask the person, you know, um, was it like that before? And if they say no, we go with that. Um, I mean, in a house, it may not be as obvious, but in a, a business like that with a tile floor, you can kind of know that, hey, we, we swept up and there wasn't uh, fibers on the ground when we left. Right, on a regular basis, we don't have fibers laying around in the same way you would at your house because who knows how many times you vacuum right. on a weekly basis. And let's go to now Adam's question from Abbotsford, Wisconsin. Take it away, Adam. Could the tweezers affect the fabric? Okay, uh, the tweezers we use are a one-time use. They're sterile. Um, I actually took it out of a plastic package, used it for the one time, and it's disposed of. So there's no cross-contamination. Um, that's a big thing that on our unit is we focus on cross-contamination. We avoid that at all costs. Uh, as you can tell, I can during this video, I changed my gloves uh, probably eight, nine times to make sure there's no chance of it being cross-contaminated. But yes, we use a one-time use uh, only tweezers. Well, that's great. I I guess that makes logical sense, but I honestly must admit I never really thought about that. The tweezer industry really likes you. Yeah, these are, uh, they've, they've come down, we used to use one-time use metal ones, and now we're down to a plastic, so they're, they've become more cost effective. And is there a kind of a time frame of, of a general nature about analyzing fiber evidence, like between you, got, you sending it back to the lab and them coming up with information that would be helpful to the investigation, is it 24, 48, or does it just depend? It, it depends. Um, they, they'll do it in a priority. Um, obviously, fingerprints are the most reliable, so we go with them first, uh, then the DNA. Fiber might be a little further down the line. That might actually hold off on it in case we don't get anything from the other pieces of evidence. And we've had an email question come in, and don't forget, you can email us at live at hectv.org. Colors fade over time. Does that potentially affect the test of the fiber, like, or will you be able to know what the original color was? Uh, with the chemical test, they actually break it down to its uh, chemical level, and they'll be able to know exactly what it is from that. So, 
Very good. So we have fiber evidence, which may or may not matter to the ultimate guilty partner in our crime here. Let's look now at some physical evidence that was left behind. We've got a rag that was left behind, obviously, and let's go to that roll now. So this is obviously very at the door, um, where there was an exit and entrance into the room. And, you're, and so this is a different pair of gloves you're using now from what you used previously. Yes. And, and I notice you're being very careful, almost you could say very gingerly working the rag. Why does that really matter to you? There could be something inside that I don't want to lose. Um, it was kind of balled up, and if I just shake it out, I could lose something. So you try to be gentle with it, keep everything there. And when I seize it at the end, I fold it inward so stuff doesn't fall out. Oh, so you actually fold the envelope inward so stuff doesn't fall out. So this envelope that I'm going to have right here now then, that we're going to see, is going to be the envelope we'll see in just a moment uh, as you do it. Now here, you're beginning to work on the process, and we've got some student questions about this. So we're going to watch this video so students can ask. But please note, especially to those of you who are just joining us and seeing this video for the first time, what the process is here. As you, now do the eyedroppers and the bottles change each time too, or like are you using you know, a certain supply for... Um, a number of stuff. Our swabs are changed every time. Okay. Uh, the chemicals that I carry with me, I drop on it so they're not actually ever in contact with anything. Okay. But we just refill and change when it's needed. Okay. And there you see him actually closing up the evidence uh, bag and putting it in there and numbering it. And now when we come back, you actually see this evidence bag here with number three right there on it. You open it up, and indeed, if life is good, and hopefully this is not going to contaminate me in any way. The, the evidence comes out and here we have our physical rag. Let's go to some student questions that, ha that they had about this evidence. And we're going to start by going up to Austin again in Abbotsford, Wisconsin. What are the numbers next to the evidence? The numbers, how they work. Okay, um, I number each uh, piece of evidence individually so it can be separated at the lab. And also, in, it's mostly, it's used a lot in court. You know, evidence item number three is the rag, where there's no confusion between it, the fibers, and whatever other evidence I took at the time. Uh, some of our scenes get up to where I'm in um, the triple digit numbers. I'm in 101 piece of evidence. And if I just tried to keep it all straight in my mind, there'd be no way I could do it. You'd have to do, that's why we keep the numbers there. So uh, I can keep it straight in my mind, as well as be able to explain it later to my lab people and to the court. Very good. Let's go to Samsel Upper Elementary School because they've got a question for you about something you did in the process. Go for it, Samsel. What is the liquid in the two bottles? Uh, the two bottles I use is our presumptive blood test. Uh, those of you that are fans of the show CSI, that's the stuff where they, when they drop it on, it turns bright blue and they go, we've got blood. <laughs> Ours is, uh, it turns pink when it's uh, test positive for uh, blood. Uh, it's mostly used so I don't collect a lot of stuff that isn't blood. Um, you'll be surprised how many liquids can kind of resemble blood in the thing. If someone spills soda on the ground, you might think that the soda syrup kind of looks like blood. This test would let me know if it was or not, so I'm focusing and dealing with what we need to. Very good. Thanks very much, New Jersey. Let's go back to McKenzie in this instance at St. Elizabeth Middle School in Missouri. What is the chance they will get, get unusable or get usable DNA off the dirt rag? So are there you know, obviously, you have no idea when you look at that that there's going to be DNA because you don't know what is there. It could be just like oil from a car or something. But does that happen frequently? Do you get a lot of usable DNA from that kind of investigation? Oh, yes. If we would have something like this and it tested, uh, did my test and it tested positive for blood, uh, we're going to get DNA from it. It's just, uh, it's come so far, just in even the five years I've been in the unit, the DNA has come. Uh, we're making so many hits on it um, every year. It's almost catching up with fingerprints on how many we're getting. Just the technology has come so far. Um, and what's the time frame for that kind of thing? You send the rag in, and do you have to, I mean, do you have to wait a while before the DNA results come back? It, uh, we only have so many technicians, so it's kind of a backlog. And also, like a burglary, you kind of put it at the bottom of the pile, but um, homicide would jump above it. So it's kind of like it gets there. But um, our lab is actually, um, to within a month, we'd have it. Oh, okay. So if, um, some departments have to send it to the state lab, and that's a year wait. So okay. We're fortunate to have our own lab, so we get back fairly quickly. Very good. And now let's go to Durand High School for a question from Skyler. Why do you take pictures of all the evidence? Good question. Okay. That's uh, documentation for court. And also, uh, when I go back to review it, because this court case isn't going to go before a judge for maybe one or two years. And I do five or six crime scenes a day. I can't, I have a pretty good memory, but not that good. So the photos are always a documentation, a permanent history of what happened. Um, like in court, we always use it as accurate depiction of the scene as I saw it at the time, um, because they can't, 
you know, jurors also can't look into my mind and see what I saw that day. So we can put a photo in front of them, they can go, oh, okay, I can start to see what you saw at the time. Very good. And we had an email question come in from Mitch that kind of deals with this, especially since we're dealing with the time frame. Does the chain of evidence ever really get challenged a lot in court? Is that something that comes up frequently that you all really have to be aware of a lot? Um, our department's solid on chain of custody, and um, I hardly ever get questioned on it. But uh, like one of the famous cases was the O.J. Simpson case. A lot of the evidence got thrown out just because of chain of evidence. And also, you know, they, that's when the big change in glove thing came on because they were filming everything. And they were getting, some of the technicians weren't changing gloves, so cross-contamination, a lot of evidence got thrown out. So that's why we focus so much on making sure that we don't, I mean, a lot of time my only audience is the reporting officer and maybe the victim, mm -hmm. but then again, I want to be able to testify every time that I change my gloves between every piece of evidence, so there's never a challenge on that. And Eric, as, a, as the person who responds to the scene now, are you doing, uh, he, obviously Brian's going to take a while to get there, are you doing something to make sure contamination is, is minimal? there to keep people out of the scene? What kinds of things do you do then? Well, generally after we take the statement of the victim and we request the ID unit to come out, um, if it's something such as a burglary where there's just like a, a computer taken or whatnot, um, we would either secure the scene until he got there or sometimes it depends on how backed up they are, we would leave a card with the victim and just tell him or her not to disturb anything and uh, he would get there and get the card that has the okay. report number and the information on it that he would need to go through it all. Well, very cool. So we've got rag, we've got some fiber, and of course we also had some blood stains that were left near the windowsill. And so we're going to begin to look at that evidence too, but as we do that, I want to go first to a question from, I'm going to pronounce it Kira, K-I-R-A, maybe it's Kyra, feel free to correct me, up in Durand High School, Wisconsin. Kira, what's your question that you're going to ask about working with these blood samples? What is the stuff that you put on the swab? So as we begin to look at the video, we can talk to that right away about the stuff that's put on the swab. So again, you're taking some photos of the location, again, for that documentation purpose. And in this instance, we're actually able to see the blood pretty well. So if that window had been open, there might have been some potential moisture. But in essence, that wasn't an issue that you had to worry about at this point in time at all. And so you begin to process again. And so let's talk a little bit about this. What is this stuff you're pulling out here, and how does it work? Okay, it's a two-part um, presumptive blood test. The two chemicals, uh, one first is put on, then the uh, substance is put on it, and it will react with the second one in a positive or negative fashion. Um, the two chemicals, um, potassium, I should have it memorized, but I always have it on a cheat sheet when I go to court. But uh, they react uh, chemically together when there's a hemoglobin from the blood is in there. Um, I've been our experts at the lab tell me it's going to li limit it to a human or a primate. So unless a gorilla is running around, we don't have to worry about that. So, you know, we get a lot of times like, a lot of times unfortunately on burglaries, they break a window coming in, the family dog will walk through the glass and I have a blood trail and it's canine blood and it won't test positive for this. So it's a way to eliminate and exclude that from being part of the scene. So we're not worrying at this point yet about like what blood type it is. We're just determining right now on scene if it's human blood. Correct. Very cool. Let's go to a question about labeling of evidence that comes to us from Emma at St. Elizabeth. Take it away, Emma. What kind of system do you have for labeling? And how would the blood evidence have been labeled? Um, it goes with my number. Um, and that's case that was number one, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, number one, because it was the first thing inside the window I found. On the, uh, on the box where I put the swab. Let's see. We're going to go right here. I'll put it this okay. way so we can lay it and let Pete just see it as close as possible. Go right ahead. Okay, right. I, it's, I labeled it as the swab of blood stain from the window seal. Um, if I had more than one window seal uh, with blood on it, I would label it, you know, northwest window seal or um, vice versa. I usually, if there's more than one blood stain, this one I had one, so I just labeled it as the blood stain. If I had more, I'd put the direction and where uh, it was located. It's uh, just so I can testify to it later that that is the swab that I took from that window seal. Oh, very cool. So we've got blood from the windowsill. Now we've got to set it off the lab to do something with it. And that's where a question comes in from Samsell Upper Elementary School again. Take it away, New Jersey. How does the blood get matched to the person? All right. Um, I take it to our lab. Uh, we have scientists who uh, are specialty in DNA. Uh, they would uh, break it down the blood sample I got down to their uh, DNA pattern, which is unique to everyone. Um, it actually comes out as a little printout of a chart with ups and downs going on their, uh, the breakdown. And if we had a suspect, 
I'd get a swab from them, which is kind of like I take a, one of our swabs, they put it in their cheek, and they take a little sample of their uh, cells from inside their cheek, and then we'd send it to the lab, and they would get an absolute match if it matches, or it'd be an exclusion, where if uh, they uh, take it and it doesn't match, that's not our guy. So. so that's an important thing, I think, for everybody to realize. You've gotten sort of some DNA information from this blood sample, but that DNA information isn't going to do anything for you unless you've got somebody to apply it to, right? Correct. So it's not the DNA evidence alone that's going to necessarily nail the, sus nail the criminal because you have to have some sort of other information that's going to make you think, oh, this is a guy we want to go out and test. Correct. And then I'm assuming a judge has to issue some sort of warrant to make, or can, can you just ask somebody to offer you a, a sample? Okay. We have a form, a consent to search form. They can sign and voluntarily give us a sample of their DNA or we go court orders and we do that all the time. The judges are familiar with it and it's a pretty simple process to get the court order if we need it. And now specifically related to this crime, the question becomes what April is going to ask us now from Abbotsford, Wisconsin. Take it away, April. Did the blood on the rag match the blood on the wall? So in this instance, did the blood on the rag match the blood on the wall? Is it from the same source? Uh, I wouldn't know that at the time because uh, uh, a lot of times burglaries, um, they're not always just one person. There are going to be a few going through and especially on a broken window case, um, they all of them might, break, uh, might cut themselves going through the window, so they might be bleeding in different locations. Um, with the test I do, I just make sure it is blood. I, don't, I can't type it or test it at the scene, so I just take it all to the lab, and the lab would sort out if there's multiple sub subjects. Also, a lot of good things on our uh, homicide scenes is uh, commingled blood, where it's the victims and the suspects mixed together. That puts the person at the time of the crime there. So uh, blood evidence is great. Um, but at the time, I don't know whose is whose. I just collect what's there. So we have blood evidence, we have physical evidence, we've got fiber evidence, and of course, as you notice, we're also about to have some fingerprint evidence. And before we see that video, a couple of questions to help set this up. I'm gonna go straight back to Abbotsford, Wisconsin. Molly, you've got a general question that we can talk about as we look at this video. What is it? How did he know where to dust? Okay, so one question we'll look at is how did you know where to go to dust the window? And secondly, let's go to Austin again in Durand, Wisconsin. Austin, what's your question? What exactly is the substance that you put on the window? So we'll talk to those two things as we begin to look at this video now of processing the fingerprint evidence. In terms of knowing where to dust, are you, are you getting that from what your officers on the scene have noticed? Or are you doing some up-close investigation of all potential locations in the room? And that could take a long time. Well, it could take a long time. This one, um, she says the window was shut when she left and it's open now. That's a pretty obvious that something's been uh, uh, manipulated. So I'll, I'll look there. I also look at all potential points of entry. I'll check all the doors, uh, windows, etc. But when you have something as, as obvious as this was, that the window was shut, now it's open, I'll definitely check. Uh, just from my experience, I get to where they usually push or lift the windows. So I know the look that you'll see me, I'll check the, the window surface itself, and I saw the handprints there. And also, I'll, I check the frame to see if he lifted it. Uh, but uh, this one, I found it right where he uh, had placed his hands, and uh, that's where I focus my attention. Uh, the and substance I use... Yeah, what is the substance? There's two different kind of powders. The one I like is magnetic. It's uh, metal shavings have been magnetized, so they will uh, uh, attach the oils that are left by the hands. It's much cleaner. Um, I got tired of breathing in the other stuff uh, for eight hours a day. Um, but that, the other stuff is graphite because it's ground up. Um, it's pretty simple stuff, um, easy to use, and it gives you good results. And we see the tape being placed on there right now, and when we come back out of the video, you're actually going to see this evidence on this card, as you see right now, Brian is placing it on the card. And I see that it's A3505, and A, talk about that labeling system again, just okay. for clarity. Uh, on my fingerprint evidence, I use letters um, to separate it from the physical evidence where I use numbers. Uh, the 3505, that's my designation, that's my badge number, so I can testify that this is the evidence that I seized at this time. Uh, on a big scene, we might have uh, multiple crime scene detectives uh, fingerprinting um, different uh, areas, so we'd be able to distinguish whose fingerprints were taken by whom. Um, and on the back, I put uh, where I got it from, uh, so just, it's also for the fingerprint expert to be able to, to know where the, the evidence came from, and also for me later, and court, I know where it came from. Very cool. Candace, let's go to your question from St. Elizabeth Middle School. Is there any special way that you have to put the dust on to make it work? And if you put the dust on too thick, does it still work? 
Yeah, you, it's a technique. It's definitely something. I went to classes on it before I got in the unit, but it's just over my years I've learned the best the ways to do it. The magnetic, you kind of just kind of hold it almost off a little bit, and it almost attaches itself. It sticks to it. It kind of wants to go there. Um, at the end, you can see me use the feather brush where I'm kind of wisping it around. That kind of removes the excess and just leaves what is uh, needed for uh, examination. Very cool. We're going to stay in St. Elizabeth for Tori's next question. Do you use this special kind of tape? Let's talk about the tape because we see it right here up close on these pieces of evidence. Is it regular scotch tape or something different? It's made by um, a company for this, for fingerprint evidence. Uh, it's not as sticky as like a, a box tape or something else because they're actually, our experts are looking through the tape at the print. If it was thicker, it'd be more difficult for them to see. So it's, a, it's actually very thin. You got to be careful not to rip it in half, which does happen, and then you have to deal with it. But it, okay. It's, it's um, specially made by uh, evidence companies for us. Very good. And let's go to the lab now. Sam Upper Elementary School, what's your question about next steps? Once you have fingerprints, what is your next step? What happens next? Okay. I transport it to our lab where we have fingerprint experts. Um, they're latent fingerprint experts. They've been trained on uh, what to look for. Um, you know, your arches, your rules, your, your uh, different types of fingerprints. They try to identify six markers at least, and that way we can run it um, in the system uh, called APHIS, which is a nationwide uh, fingerprint system. Um, also, if you have a suspect, they love suspects because they get the fingerprints from the suspect and they can set their one-to-one, -one, go on his right thumb to this one, and that's an absolute match. Um, even if you have the suspect in the APHIS system, it only hits 80% of the time. So it may say he's not in the system, and later when we narrow down a suspect, we'll do it again, and it will hit. So it's, uh, the computer's good, but it's not great. It's not um, like on TV where it always comes up to the guy, it's this guy, and this is his address, and he's there right now. It, it will give you an idea. So you don't necessarily work in 60-minute CSI uh, time frames. Correct. Very good. Uh, we've got all sorts of different pieces of evidence, and now we've got to think about how that evidence might matter to the investigation. That's actually a question we ask our students in advance, and so we want to find out from them what evidence they thought might matter the most. So let's go to Sam Upper Elementary School first. New Jersey, what was your thought? Um, the most special one was the blood on rag for DNA evidence. All right, so we've got blood on rag as one offer. Durand High School with Skyler, what were you guys thinking? Um, I said the fingerprints because they're more unique than blood type. Okay, so that's an important thing to consider. And you guys were basing that simply on the video. The folks at uh, St. Elizabeth spent a little bit of time with the police report. And Jesse, based on the police report, what are you noticing that the officers might find really, really helpful? Well, the, footprint, the footprints in the bloody cloth and the brand of the computer. The fact that she doesn't know the identity of the people she met in the alley. The general, the general and the general description of the people. The footprints are helpful because they could determine they could help determine shoe size and the treads on the shoes. The blo the bloody cloth could provide DNA. The brand name of the computer could help them track down the computer. And the fact she doesn't know the people in the alley because it was probably not a student or anyone who's normally there. The general description is important because it could help locate the suspects. Very good information and we learn a combination there of what we, you would have picked up on site as well as what was taken, the computer as well. And they mentioned footprint evidence, and actually there, and there was a footprint that was also left behind. And we, if we have time, we're going to have a chance to show that as well. But footprint evidence was part of what was going on. So talk a little bit about this weighing of the evidence. You've got um, a blood sample that somebody thinks might be good from the DNA. You've got fingerprints. Are fingerprints more helpful than blood? Is there any, you know, one or the, check six of one, half dozen of the other, or what? Well, right now, fingerprints are still our most reliable because it has the larger database. There's more fingerprints on file than DNA samples. But in recent years, the DNA samples are catching up. Uh, if you ever go to jail for any uh, felony crime, any felony crime, it used to be violent. Now it's any felony crime, your DNA is put in the system. So that database is constantly building, and it's going to catch up to fingerprints uh, soon. So it's becoming as reliable as fingerprints. Um, it's more specific because uh, your DNA is your DNA. Fingerprints, you still have to get the, a good lift and get the right um, enough points to make a positive match. If I get just a little bit of your blood, I'm going to have your DNA. So it's um, easier to get a, a, a identification off of blood than fingerprints. I have to get a good lift. Where DNA, I just have to get a little bit of your blood. And um, also touch DNA, sweat, 
stuff like that. If I get just a, any bit of your DNA, it can be matched. A fingerprint, I have to get a good lift. Okay. And then we also notice footprints. We're going to run the footprint video, and, and as we talk about this, are footprints more helpful than fingerprints? Extremely helpful? How do footprints and shoe prints work into your investigation? Uh, it's, a, it's another identification tool. Uh, I can, using my photographs and scales and uh, the lift, we can get shoe size, uh, type, uh, make. There is no uh, national database for shoes yet. It's, it's coming soon. Uh, but it's also, it can uh, get someone's shoe size uh, and can help include and exclude people. That's the big thing. If uh, the suspect's wearing a size 12 shoe and we bring in a guy that wears an 8, it's going to be kind of hard to, <laughs> to place them there. Uh, I mean, not to say that people don't wear their bigger brother shoes and run around sometimes in different sizes, but also a shoe print can be uh, a unique feature. Uh, I can buy a pair of shoes the same time as someone else, and we can have the exact same pair as we're leaving the store, but within a few days they're different because our weight's different. We walk differently. I might pick up a rock in my tread where you haven't, and that would show up in my evidence. Very good. So that evidence could easily matter as well. All of these things together then is what the police are using as they begin to winnow down the possible suspects for this crime. And obviously that's what we've done here. And at some point, after you've got all this evidence collected and you talk to the witnesses again, you're going to actually try to get them to identify who they think might have been the perpetrator of the crime, right? Correct. And that's when photo array becomes important. And we're now going to meet uh, Nicole Thiesman, I believe was her uh, name in the video, the administrator, uh, portrayed by Alana from Bayless. Come on up, come on, join me here. Because we're going to do a little bit of work on photo array as I move the evidence box out of the way. And come on right between us. Hi, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you. So um, we've got a photo array. And talk a little bit about the process with photo arrays. How do you figure out the different photos you're going to put in. I mean, obviously, it's not just, you know, anybody who goes into the pictures. Right. Uh, we have a computer system where if we have a suspect, we put him in or her and put their physical description, um, height, weight, uh, skin tone, how they wear their hair, and then uh, the computer system will run through and find uh, mug shots or photos we have that are of similar people. And um, you'll look at it and you could tell sometimes you just have to throw one out because somehow someone got listed as a black male and they're obviously a white person and then they come up and they're like, oh yeah, that one can't be in there. But you mix, uh, you try to get similar uh, makes, features, and then uh, that will set it up for you and then you just show it to the witness to see if they can make an identification. Speaking of witness identification, we asked the students for some information of how they might describe the suspect, the person they actually saw commit the crime. And so we had the following descriptions that came from you guys that I want to mention here before we go into your identification of the individual who committed the crime. First we learned for, he's a Caucasian male, average height and slim, they said, from St. Elizabeth. The hoodie of dark blue or black, the cut in his right hand wearing blue jeans. Samso mentioned that he was tall, slender, maybe 18 plus with dark hair and eyes. And Duran mentions that he's a male, average height, and interestingly enough, looks like a thug. And I like that descriptor, but I, I wanted to mention that specifically. At that point then, if someone describes that to you, Eric, are you then asking them more specific questions, like what do you mean by thug, that kind of thing? What do you go into to get more details from them? Correct. I would ask them what they mean by looks like a thug and try to get more descriptors on what they might think a thug would look like because people have different opinions on what a thug could be. So we go into more uh, descriptors, wearing a hood up or different things like that. And you've probably seen on television in some sort of cop and robber show over time, somebody sitting with mugshot books at a police desk looking for all these potential people. And then, of course, in some instances you see lineups where people are like identifying a suspect in a lineup where, again, you're looking for people of similar height, similar look, facial structure, that kind of thing. Or maybe they have a photo array like this. And this is the photo array of our suspects. And I'll have you go ahead and move around so you're on the other side of, uh, and of course, you know who the, the individual was since you were part of the filming of it. But you guys are going to notice, and we, we've got a, uh, a screen image there, but you can see it in real time right here in terms of the actual height that the witness and size that the witness will look at as you look at the pictures. And so take me through what you would do as she identifies this photo array. What are you going to ask her? What okay. are you going to say to her? I'd present this, uh, I'd go, this is a photo array of uh, possible suspects, the guy the subject who uh, we think committed crime may or may not be in the photo array. Sometimes you'll give them one that's not, just to verify that they are giving you accurate uh, statements. Um, you do not try to push uh, anything. You know, sometimes you might have somebody, you, you know, on TV you'll see them present it like, do you, is this the guy? Do you see him? Do you, you can't do that. You can't be going, you know, 
are you sure he's here? You know, you can't, you just have to show it to them and let them independently look at it and see if they uh, recognize the person. Well, let's go back to our image of the photo array because I want to go to our different school groups that are joining us interactively and let them tell us by number who they think it might be. So we're going to start with St. Elizabeth Middle School in Missouri. St. Elizabeth, based on the video that you've seen, which number of suspect do you think is the guilty party? We think that the three people walking down the street could possibly be one, two, and five. All right, so one, two, or five. And based on of those three of one, two, and five, could you, could you give us any idea about which one you think might actually have been in the room and taken the computer? We think it was probably two. All right, we're going with number two. Let's go to Samsell, New Jersey, Upper Elementary School. What are you guys thinking? We'll bring the image back up again for a moment so you guys can see it again before we go to you for you guys' response. So you see the picture right then again. Samsell, what are you thinking? Which number? Five. Ooh, five. <laughs> Samsell is ready with number five. Let's go to Durand High School, Wisconsin. Durand will bring up the image again so you can see it one more time and make sure that you know what number you want to look to. Durand, what are you thinking? Seven. He looks seven. much like a thug. So we have a two, we have a five, we have a seven. And let's go to Abbotsford Middle School, Wisconsin. Abbotsford, you guys, which one do you think it might be? We'll bring up the picture one more time. Which one do you think it might be? Number six. Yeah. All right, yeah. Yeah. All right I'll six. let you guys mute again. So we'll, we have the potential of two, five, six, and seven. And way back at the beginning, St. Elizabeth mentioned that they thought maybe the three guys who walked past you were one, two, and five. Anella, who are the guys who were walking past you in the video? What numbers are they? There were five, seven, and I believe three. Okay, so five, seven, and three were our suspects, potential suspect. And the actual individual who committed the crime, Anella, is? Number five. Number five. So congratulations to Sam Sill Upper Elementary School for getting that. It is number five who committed the crime. And when you put all of this kind of stuff together, you know, eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable at times. Talk a little bit about how this is helpful and how you actually end up being able to utilize this kind of information then. Okay, this is uh, useful when uh, we pretty much have it narrowed down to who we think it is and we want to get that positive last little uh, piece of uh, identification uh, done. Um, eyewitness stuff, it is uh, difficult, like in an armed robbery, the person will tell you what the gun looks like exactly and you'll ask them what the guy looks like, I have no idea. Mm. Because you get stressed and you don't look at their face, you're looking at what they're threatening you with. Um, on this one, um, it would be kind of difficult because it's just guys walking down the street, like you said before, you're not thinking. Uh, hopefully we don't live in a place where you think everybody's a suspect, where you try to memorize everybody you see because you, oh, they're going to do something. You know, hopefully we kind of live in a place where it's okay, you know, but then you try to think back. So, uh, yeah, eyewitnesses sometimes are unreliable, but uh, sometimes, I mean, if it's uh, a, a crime where you walk in face to face with them and you've got locked in and you know what they look like, it can be very useful. Very helpful. So there you have a little bit of the process about what goes into the science behind investigating a crime. If you've got more questions, don't forget you can email them to us at live at hectv.org and we'll give you responses after the program. We've got a couple of general questions. I want to ask this for Woodland Hills High School out in Pennsylvania who's joining us via the internet. Paul wants to know, just in general, what do you find as a detective like this? What's the hardest part of figuring out a whodunit like this? What's the toughest part? Um, knowing what you have. Um, sometimes, you know, just thanks to TV, um, gloves are a big part of every burglar's uh, arsenal now. They, uh, they watch enough TV to know that we're looking for fingerprints. Um, you know, I just had a crime this weekend where the guy thought he was a minor detective and he thought he was cleaning up the scene perfectly, uh, but I found blood in multiple places and was able to, to get the murder charge on him. Uh, but he thought he was smart. You know, he's, mm -hmm. he, was, he thought he had cleaned up this, this um, scene absolutely, but you always leave something and you always take something with you. So just know that we're, we always, uh, there's always something. I mean, uh, but it's just trying to look at the big picture, narrow it down to the smallest detail and know what to collect. All right, and Eric, I'll ask you this picture. This could be a long answer. Give me about the 30 or 45 second version. Thank you, Felicia, for this email question. What are some actions one can do to prevent crime that people typically don't think of? Um, typically, they don't think, just lock everything up. Um, we deal with a lot of car break-ins that people just leave their cars unlocked. And uh, we have people that just walk by and check handles and doors. And if it's open, they go in and they shuffle through everything and take whatever they want. So that's probably one of the main things is just make sure everything's locked up. And uh, 
it probably doesn't hurt to leave a light on somewhere in the back so it looks like somebody's there or something like that. But, but ma the main thing is making sure everything's completely locked up. Very good. Eric, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Brian, any final words about the detective process? 30 seconds you'd oh, like to mention? Uh, just uh, like I said, uh, every crime they leave something and take something with them. And it's our job to identify that and uh, match the suspect to the crime. And uh, we do a great job of it here. Yes, you do. And you did a great job working with us. Brian, thank thanks so very, very much. And Anella, representing all the great kids from Bayless Television, thank you so much for putting the extraordinary videos together. Extremely well thank done. You. The archive of the program will be up and running on our website, hectv.org, in just about a week, so you can go and see it again and send other folks to it. All the video evidence that we saw on the show and the materials that were part of the interactive work for the teachers who joined us interactively will also be posted on the website. So when people go to the archive, a teacher could choose to use it at any point in time. And it's also available for free download on the HECTV page on iTunes U. Our thanks to the Bayless School District, Mike Hawkins and everybody from Bayless TV for putting the videos together, the great folks of St. Louis County Police Department for giving you a behind the scenes look at the science that goes into investigating a crime. For me, this has been an especially cool show because because I always love Law and Order and Cops and Robbers, and I must admit I still watch Murder, She Wrote on, on repeats and all that good stuff. So in a personal way, thank you all very much. This was absolutely great. We look forward to seeing you next week when the subject changes entirely, and we talk on Thursday about Abraham Lincoln and the passage of the 13th Amendment. Thanks very much. Bye, everybody.